Today we're looking at Section 3 of Chapter 2 in AP United States History, British Economic Policies and Discontent on the Frontier. We're going to establish some rudimentary taxation laws that we put in place to help uh, fund our newly acquired territory as a result of the French and Indian War, as well as discuss some conflicts that are arising on the frontier with the uh, individuals who have been assimilated into our empire that are not overly positive about that fact. Objective for the day, explain the atrocities and abuse of power committed by Great Britain. Uh, one thing I want you all to know is the use of the word atrocities. So you want to go with heinous crimes and heinous abuse of power here. Exceptionally bad. Okay. Obviously you could have just abuse of power and abuse of, uh, of your overall influence on an area, but we're going to use the word atrocities because this is real bad. Homework for tonight, keep rolling on this. YouTube video will be available later if you didn't get your notes completed. Objectives, keep working on them. You, you will be able to add to all of your objectives today. And then ignore this last one. That was actually from last year and I forgot to edit it. Okay, continuing forward here, document E. Content, as always, provided. Okay, you can partition this up into a few different things here. One, Ben Franklin is your first point. Okay, he's the source author uh, and the individual who's being put into question. Uh, number two here, you could put the entire testimony before Parliament, or you could just have Parliament if you wish. And then three, the date. And again, this is always provided, so it's up to you if you all want to write this down, but nonetheless, it's there for you. Okay. Other items you might want to consider including here would be Great Britain, 1763, America, the actual bracketized source, Colbert, Eyewitness to America, page 54. So again, this is an excerpt from an edited document. The use of the word crown, because it's been made a proper noun, as far as bestowing an actual individual and not just an object. Okay. Now looking at this document, Ben Franklin, who's being, who's being on, he's on trial, okay, he's on he's testimony before Parliament. What was the temper of America towards Great Britain before the year 1763? So one thing I would have here as far as a contextual message, this is, he's asking about pre-French and Indian War, okay? This testimony is concerning conditions before the French and Indian War. What was life like in the colonies? What were the conditions that were being placed and put upon the colonists? All right, well, one thing you would want to mention here with that contextual message is the component of salutary neglect. Okay, SN, salutary neglect. That's the time period that's in reference. And like you can see here in um, Franklin's testimony, they submitted willingly to the government of the crown. People are happy. They're not oppressed. They're not being taxed wildly out of control. Okay, there's a standing military, but it's being placed there to protect them against Native American incursions, the French, and other foreign foes. So people are happy, and that's something you'd want to mention in your contextual message. Now, continuing forward here, the use of diction. They had not only a respect, but an affection for Great Britain, for its laws and customs, manners, etc. And affection. Not only do we respect the crown, but we love England. Okay, the, the notion of God save the queen. We love our country. They, the countrymen within the colonies have a total admiration for the crown. People are happy. Okay. Other things you want to have down here, looking at uh, specifically is the component of culture. So X equals culture. Okay. One thing you'd want to have, fondness for its fashions, greatly increased in the commerce. Meaning economically, you could have econ equals good. So many great things are going on in the new world. Why change anything? The French and Indian War will do that. So again, pre-1763. What happens in 1763? The end of the French and Indian War. The proclamation line of 1763 is established and people get miserable. Okay? Looking at the critique section here, you have your author, Ben Franklin. I would go the route of credible here. All right? He's ha he, is being, he is proposing a testimony before Parliament. Joe Schmo just can't walk up and defend what's going on in the colonies. You have to have an academic background. So you could say author credibility, good. Academic background, testimony before Parliament. He's respected in the region to the point of which they're asking him about what's going on. So you could continue your author credibility here with good. He's been in the colonies for quite some time. He can afford a voyage back to England. Right? He's an astute individual. 
intended audience, it's a testimony before parliament. Audience is parliament. So audience equals parliament. Your piece of evidence there, source provided. All right? And then continued on, uh, source credibility as a whole. I would say good. I would say this is a credible source, okay? Because there is not a component of bias. They're asking his opinion, which he's providing. They asked him to do that, though. He's not just providing it, okay? Also, it gives you the specific information down here at the bottom as far as where we are getting this actual information from, okay? Anytime we can do that, we provide the source information as well as the published work that it's hailing from, increases document credibility significantly. Okay, It's like uh, when you all write papers for your other classes or eventually when you write a paper in here where you have to provide an in-text citation. I understand you're using the works of an academic source, but if you don't credit that source, it appears as though you have a great idea. If you can bring in a researched individual, Dr. So-and-so from Harvard, boom, your credibility of your document goes way up. Okay. Content section down to the bottom here. Resolutions of the Stamp Act Congress. So I would put this in here. One, resolutions, okay? Meaning these are the results of a governing body. So number one, resolutions. Two, Stamp Act Congress. And then three, your year. Okay, now notice the transition here. 1766 is the testimony asking about 1763. Now we're jumping to 65. Okay, so we're moving around a little bit here, but we're trying to establish a theme of discontent with all of these documents. The theme here is discontent, the evolution of discontent. Meaning beforehand, when we look at the first document of George Washington, we love our country. Ben Franklin saying 1763, before then, we love our country. Afterwards, starts to fall apart. Okay? Contextual messages here. Only the representatives of the people, these colonies, and persons are chosen there and by themselves, and that no taxes have ever been made or can constitutionally be imposed on them. We are addressing what? Something that they will go to war over. Blank without blank. Yeah, taxation. taxation without representation here. So X equals tax without rep. Okay? That's what this document is addressing. We have no, I mean, depending on the, the amount of taxation that's taking place, we have no issue with pay, paying taxes to the crown but we need to know what we will receive out of that. We want representation in Parliament. Well, the argument is you have virtual representation. Does that ever get anything done in the colonies? Certainly not. Okay. Other contextual messages here. Uh, imposing them but by their respective legislatures. We are seeking a representative form of government. Okay. So you have taxation without representation is the theme as a whole. We are specifically seeking a representative form of government. Now, true or false, parliament is a representative form of government. True. True, absolutely. It's a bicameral legislature, the House of Lords, and the House of Commons. It's based off of that. But how many of the lords and then how many of the individuals in the House of Commons are representing the colonies? Zero. Zero. Okay? We don't have an issue with the government that's already in place, but expand it. Represent us. Okay? That's about all we can do here for contextual messages. So in this example here, two would be fine. Okay, Two would be fine just to be very descriptive and eloquent when you write about them. Critique section, your, your author is who? Are you able to extract this? The actual individual who penned this. Author is unknown. Okay, author is unknown. Author credibility. Now, before you jump on the absolutely not bandwagon, okay, look what we have here. Decisions of the Stamp Act Congress. So, author credibility. What do you think? I, I'd say it's pretty credible. You could say author unknown, yet source is credible, as this is a summarization of, of the Congress. Which we know happened. In exactly. Someone was in that facility writing about the actions taking place there. We don't know specifically who. But it is someone of an academic standard. Okay? I say it's limited. You could say limited, absolutely. Where you would go the route of arguing unknown, but it's from the Stamp Act Congress. It's an exact date, too. So. Exactly. Okay? Audience, what do you guys think? I, oh, the, this is, it's kind of difficult. 
the audience, the people, like your, that, that seems like it's probably like, uh, like if you were putting that into like a newspaper, like to just tell them what the resolution was, it'd be like the people. Maybe just tell them like the Britain yeah, legislature. Okay, yeah, like so you could argue that the intended audience might be Parliament, might be. Yeah. Okay, but again, you'd have to go the route of arguing why you think that. These are resolutions. These are the decided thoughts of the Stamp Act Congress. Now. When, you, when a bill is drafted to eventually become a law, how many pages is that bill usually? Multiple. Multiple. We're talking hundreds of pages. And typically speaking, when you are a lawmaker in Washington, D.C., you would have someone analyze this giant, would almost look like this encyclopedia down here. For the sake of the screencast, it's over 800 pages long. Um, would look to that size, and you'd have an individual analyze the document, summarize it for you to like a paragraph. Okay. So what I would do here, intended audience, lawmakers of the Stamp Act Congress, okay? Because this is the results of what they just talked about. For example, if you guys were to attend a student government meeting and someone's responsible for doing minutes, no one's really going to read those outside of the advisor and then maybe you if you have to look back on that. Okay, so you could consider that being what we have here. Source credibility as a whole, what do you guys think? Credible, why? If your resolutions, it means someone high-ranking made them. Okay, you, you could say this is a credible source because the group as a whole, Stamp Act Congress, right, was a credible group of academic individuals and lawmakers who drafted these re resolutions. Okay, you could go the result of still seeing limited. I still don't know who specifically penned this. Isn't this just a part of it? Like, the, and this is just an excerpt, absolutely. Yeah. Noted by our ellipsis here. Okay, this is just a part of it. But nonetheless, I would argue that credibility as a whole, it's pretty good. It's pretty good as this is a specific portion of a decided thought from a group of academic individuals. Okay, now we're gonna continue on to our notes here. Pre-Revolutionary War policy in the colonies. What's going on before the Revolutionary War takes place? Well, this period, as I've said before, is known as salutary neglect. That's our time period right there. 1750, so colonization basically to immediately after the French and Indian War, before the Revenue Acts start generating. This time period was one of positivity. This is what Ben Franklin was describing in the document, salutary neglect, which basically means you're left, you are neglected, but for the use of the word neglected in here is not bad. Okay, you are left to your own devices to govern yourself, the ultimate goal of raising revenue for the crown. Okay? In the same process, you're going to do so for yourself, so you're okay with that. Continuing forward here. What are the colonies being used for? Please As excuse it, the following interruption. The following students need to report to the computer lab in the library and bring their things with them. Leah Bachman, Abigail Baus, Caitlin Hall, Dylan Hively, Clark Nelson, Glenna Pitts, to the... Um, computer lab in the library, thank you. For the sake of the screencast, we're currently immersing ourselves in NWEA testing, and those students were not present on the day of testing. Continuing forward here, in true imperial practice, and again, I would write this down here, this is the component of imperialism, here. What we have here is the need for expansion of markets and raw materials. The, all reasons you establish a sphere of influence, protectorate, or a colony is to benefit the mother country. Okay? Typically, always economically. British mercantilist policies rarely challenged because they're difficult to implement and infrequently enforced. So basically, you have a set of economic bylaws that are in existence that everyone, for the most part, is ignoring. They're not going to enforce it. Why should I care about it? Okay? I would consider this, let's flip this economic policy and we'll use cell phones again because a lot of you were raging about that. If a teacher never enforces the cell phone policy, many of you will start bringing cell phones to that classroom, right? Mm -hmm. Like if I see John Smith in the back of the room with their cell phone on, and I'm not going to yell at him or give him a Saturday school, why wouldn't you keep bringing your cell phone back? Okay, it's the same thing. There are laws in place, but if they're never enforced, who cares? That's what we have here with economic laws. Continuing on here, as long as competition from the Americas wasn't significant, meaning it, uh, as far as foreign foes, okay? And Britain wasn't experiencing economic or fiscal crisis, which they're not. There's no, re no reason to change this. Everything is hunky-dory. If the wheel is not broken, don't fix it. Okay? 
Continuing forward, the navigation laws. Now we're going to start getting some specifics here. Okay, Strict trade policies designed to promote English shipping and control colonial trade. That's the objective. Okay, In order for Americans to trade certain enumerated items, meaning items of exceptional value, or items that could be exchanged purely as they are for value, with other nations, ships must stop in England first. Is that a bad thing? What do you think here? Here you are. You are a citizen of England. And you are exchanging with citizens of Germany. You leave South Carolina. You have to stop at London first before you can go to Germany. Is that bad? Kind of. Why? It's a waste of time. It, it completely adjusts your timetable. What if you're transporting perishable goods? Well, that's really bad. Man. Then you have a giant problem. Because you never know, you could have had you could have at sea experienced some severe weather conditions that may have already destroyed part of your cargo load, or at least slowed your trip down by a week or two. By the time you get to Germany, your perishable goods might be not worth anything. Okay, so that's a problem that we're looking at here. Other laws will be added: navigation laws of 1663, 73, and 96. Okay, allowed custom officials using the writs of assistance to search and seize smuggled commodities. Now, we've worked with the writs of assistance in a document before. Yes, we did. Okay, we're looking at the abuse of power which will eventually lead to things such as the Quartering Act. Does the English government have the right to do this? No. no. It's smuggled goods. Do they have the right to do this? Well, yes, but they don't know if there's smuggled goods. They're assuming. Okay, so they're, they're basing off of the assumption. Let's say, let's say you just have to stop at port and they just decide just to board and search your ship. Do they have a right to do that? Yes, there is. Yeah, and at their port they do. At their port, okay. Well, they're requiring you have to stop at the port. Well, then yes, they'll have to. Oh. So by law, the government is able to, because you have to stop at a port on the United Kingdom, you have to stop there. By law, it's okay that they just intrusively search your entire cargo load and say these are all smuggled items and now property of the crowd. I'm not saying it's okay. Well, you can't do that because then you're just like Ethan says. So, like you can see something you want, to say it's smuggled. Exactly. Okay. Now we have the abuse of the English Parliament here. Okay. Uh, Who okay. determines smuggled? Well, the Parliament determines smuggled. So if it actually is an illegal or hot item, you are at fault. You go to prison. But if it is not, but it is deemed illegal. That could become intrusive, okay? So you can see how this is going to start evolution, evol evolving into a negative perspective here. Were they past public execution at this point? Uh, no, we're still there. So they would so be public so uh, execution, <laughs> education. Public execution will last for quite some time. Uh, there, uh, there are elements of public execution in Texas through the 1960s yeah. by firing squad. Uh, and I think it's, um, you'd have to check, it's either Missouri or Arkansas. In one of those two states, you have you have a selection should you commit a capital offense of like nine different ways you could go. Really? Yeah, it's it's weird, weird. But nonetheless, that's how they roll down south. Okay, <laughs> sorry anyone watching the screencast, we are not just dumb Yankees. The Wool Hat and Iron Axe. Okay, mm -hmm. now we're expanding what we can tax. Intended to subordinate American capital to British capital. What does that mean? to subordinate American capital to British capital. What do you guys think? Well, if you subordinate someone, or you could say my subordinates, <laughs> to subordinate something means what? <clears throat> to set, to, to tell them to do something, like, you know, like uh, assigning them to do something. Like. Not quite. My subordinates would be subjects lesser than I. Like submit? Okay, so to subordinate someone would be to subject them to poorer conditions, or to lessen their value. Okay, so look at it like this. To lessen American capital to British capital, meaning we're going to lower the value of American currency, lower the value of American goods. Okay, stuff coming from the colonies by preventing American businessmen from turning raw materials into finished goods. <coughs> All right, well, if you look at these items here, with the exception of a, the Hat Act, but that's a symbol of high class fashion, so that will upset some people. Where, what is wool? Where does it come from? Sheep. Sheep. Okay, what do you need? What do you have to do to wool to make it valuable, though? You have to clean it, you have to make sure it's pure enough, and then you turn it eventually into textiles, right? Yeah. Yeah. You could buy just wool, and like uh, there's a Hanes commercial where he has a, a shirt made of cats. Oh, so. Okay? You could just buy wool and sit in it and be warm. But in order for it to be profitable, you have to take that primary good from your sheep 
and turn it into textiles to be then changed into drapes, bedding, clothes, etc., etc. What we will do, though, is I'm going to impose a tax, the good king in parliament. We will impose a tax restricting your ability to do that in the colonies. Meaning, where does that wool have to go to get finished? England. Back to England. Okay, so I'm going to employ all of my people who are staying within England to finish these goods and charge you for shipping it overseas. Exactly, exactly. That just increased your costs and your business exceptionally. Okay, a lot of people will lose out. Iron, what do we got with iron here? Or. Or, okay, so basically you could, you know, try to stack and manifest some kind of a structure. But in order to do anything with it, you have to smelt it and then finish it into bars and whatever else that you're making, right? Okay? Mm -hmm. They're not allowing you to do that in the American colonies. Well, that's dumb. And if you are, I'm going to tax your business for being able to do that. Sure, finish it, Mr. Smith's group back there. Finish it in the colonies. 30% of all of your sales go to the crown. That's the dumbest thing ever. Or ship back to England. We'll do it over here for you. Wait, so, you, so technically you could have iron, ship it over to England. They could smelt it, do all that, and then send it back to you without it being taxed. You would have to pay for all of that shipping. Oh, okay. Which would be so high, it would be more it would be more sensible for you all as a businessman to pay the tax. Yeah. Or to try to do it illegally and then go to prison. Because now yeah. what we do is we get stuff from China shipped to us, which obviously costs money, and then we obviously build it. Or we produce like we sell it. Exactly. Because it costs less to produce over there and it's cheaper yeah. to pay the shipping. It's basically the opposite of what happened back then. It was yeah, it's flipped. Yeah. Absolutely. And that's a great connection. Okay, the Molasses Act prevented the sale of this sweetener. Nom, 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 nom. Essential for the creation of rum, 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 rum. In the colonies to other parts of the world. Failed because it's not very well enforced. Everyone, I don't say everyone, a lot of people, both lawmakers, law officers, colonists, producers, etc., enjoy the flavor of rum. So this is one of those things that's kind of swept to the side. It's a little bit of ignored because a lot of the individuals, the colonists and lawmakers, enjoy rum. Okay. Purchase of sugar from the non-British Caribbean islands. What specific islands are we looking at here? Jamaica. Jamaica. Very good. Okay. Jamaican rum is very highly prized during this time, as well as Puerto Rico and multiple other islands. Okay. Moving forward. King George III appointed George Grenville as Prime Minister. Now, under Grenville, we're going to have the solution to their economic woes. Here come the Rev Acts. Okay? This individual, Grenville, could, you could point to him. When did American history start when Grenville <laughs> took Prime Minister? Okay? You could go that route. Proclamation of 1763 completely ends this period. All right? Prohibited colonial migration and settlement west of the Appalachian Mountains. Prohibited. Now, is that bad? You can't move west of the Appalachian Mountains. We're the crown is restricting your movement. As a citizen or a businessman, an entrepreneur who knows of the natural resources to the west, that's bad. What do you think the Native Americans are going to think about this? I got a question. How do they uh -huh. What do you think the Native Americans are going to think about this? They liked it. They like it. Absolutely. So what did this do? Proclamation 1763. It's going to anger the colonists and gain approval by Native Americans. Well, that's important because we want the Iroquois Nation to stay loyal, and we also want any Native American tribe on the western frontier to not attack us as we're moving out there, we being the government. What was your question? How did they prevent us from moving over there? They would have military fortifications throughout there. And a lot of this, too, only the more affluent individuals were really pushing through the Appalachian Mountains because it cost a lot to get through there. Mm -hmm. um, and it was very sparsely patrolled to the south where your flatter Appalachian Mountains are. Uh, because of the planter aristocracy, they didn't really need to move anyway. You know, they had their plantation, plantation system rolling. Yeah. Okay? Colonists believed the proclamation had little to do with colonial Native American hostilities and almost everything to do with control. They didn't see this as a protective measure. The government will sell you this as a don't move out there. We're not going to allow it because it's way too dangerous. The colonists are going to see this as, no, you're trying to turn a coin off of our existence and not allow us to do that for ourselves. Control. Okay? Control and fear. Moving forward. Discontent on the frontier. Here are examples, like I said, whenever you have an idea, the discontent on the frontier, give me something to work with that. 
Paxton Boys, Western Pennsylvania. That's our location. Attacked Native Americans believed to have played a role in Pontiac's Rebellion. Okay, well, we know that was an issue during the French and Indian War. Okay, so they're going to try to seek revenge because America. Demanding funding from the colony receiving word from Ben Franklin, here's our politician, that the funding, funding would be forthcoming, it's on its way, Paxton Boys quashed the rebellion and returned home. Okay? They're struggling. They're struggling because of Native American incursions, and the government is not providing that protection they said they would. Ben Franklin says it's on the way. They appease to the issue that it will be coming and stop the rebellion, stop the attack. Basically, Ben Franklin was just telling them sweet nothings just to stop them. No, Ben Franklin believed it was on its way. Oh, he yeah. No, he's a politician representing his people. He says it's on its way. Parliament will be the one that's going to say, yeah, it's on its way. Just, just stop what you're doing. Okay? See? So Ben Franklin's fighting for his people here. Echoed the rebellion occurring in 17, or excuse me, 1676, William Berkeley of Virginia failed to adhere to the cries of the colony's western frontiersmen. This is not a new idea. And like history, it is cyclical. Okay? It happens again. Takes matters to his own hand, that Daniel Bacon, Bacon's rebellions that we're looking at here, attacked Native Americans himself. He was also told, he was also told that funding was coming. And it doesn't happen. He's like, you know what? This is ridiculous. We're going to take this into our own hands. Okay? When something is promised and promised and promised, and eventually you just lose faith. Okay? It's like the boy who cries wolf with the government example. Okay, yeah, your funding's on its way, it's funding's on its way, funding's on its way, and then you get to a point where the government, the people, the citizenship just says, you guys are full of it. We don't believe you anymore. We do what we want, America. Okay? Berkeley responded to the aggression by attacking Bacon's forces, now known as Bacon's Rebellion. All right? What does Bacon do? His forces march to Jamestown, burn it to the ground. Boom. Okay? Here's our revenge. You stop our rebellion and attack us, we're going to burn your colony to the ground. Mmm discontent on the <laughs> frontier. Okay? Paxton Boys, Bacon's Rebellion feature a common theme. Now, this is a very heavy idea here. Colonial government favors the aristocracy over the people. Now, many people say that's still the same thing to this day. When you have a presidential election, what is the most important thing a lot of people pay attention to? Tax breaks. Okay, who's getting the tax break? Who's getting a tax hike if there is one? Where's the funding being shifted from? Is it going to favor big business? Is it going to favor social programming? That depends on where you fall in that politi political spectrum as far as what's important to you. But nonetheless, this is an idea that is still in existence to this day. Homework, make sure you work on this objective. Ignore this section here. Complete the notes if you didn't get a chance to. Um, and then keep building into your objectives as a whole. Great job today.